Hi, everybody. Um, this is the Quizzical Purpose Sprint Review for Court, uh, Sprint number three. Uh, this was a three-week sprint, uh, went from the 2nd to the 20th. Um, we completed 135 story points. We have 35 in progress and 28 to do. Um, this was pretty successful. We got a whole lot done this sprint, um, especially the things that got added mid-sprint, most of them got completed. Um, a few retrospective comments. Um, we got our new Jenkins server set up, so QA is using that. We're starting to use Sonar Cube for style and coverage reviews. You'll probably get a bunch of style reviews that point out little um, problems with your code. Um, those will start, there are two kinds of those. Um, if you look at Sonar Cube, uh, there are verify ones, which are uh, verify the actual um, check-ins, and then there are ones that are um, uh, that don't have verify that are tracking the master branch. Uh, so those are kind of interesting uh, to look at. Um, some of these are uh, some of these errors are more useful than others. A lot of them are, for example, in Python, Python three compatibility issues that we're not quite ready to deal with yet. Um, and we a lot of you'll notice that we don't have any coverage um, items, so that's going to get added um, sometime in the, in the near future. Uh, so just be aware that we have um, we're getting new tools on um, to for the pipeline and hopefully those will be fully integrated before the end of the before we uh, hit the release. Um, and you you may have new errors because we did improve some of our, our, our QA checks. Uh, the documentation checks are more strict. There's more um, the uh, some of the uh, lint checking is stricter. So if you do have um, errors, um, bug somebody on QA or me and we can. Um, we can help you deal with that. Um, one other thing, um, point of order before we get into JIRA. Um, given how many people are on this call uh, right now and historically, um, most people are on vacation or PTO uh, on Monday or Friday, uh, which is when sprint planning and reviews is, which isn't ideal because then we lose out on their comments on how the sprint went. Um, and I think that that's pretty important. So. I'm proposing, and I ran this by a few other people, um, uh, about changing when the start and end day of the sprint is. Um, rather than Monday and Friday, I'm going to I'm proposing that we end it on a Tuesday and start it on a Wednesday. And um, that ending on a Tuesday would probably be either at the same time as the TST meeting, um, if there's the TST meeting is in the afternoon or um, sometime early in the afternoon. And on Wednesday, would most likely replace um, the platform call. And the planning meeting and the platform call um, are sort of uh, synergistic because they both are planning out what's happening for the next sprint. So that, I, I think, is, um, is probably a better use of uh, both our time, and I think it would get more people present. Um, I, I'm looking for input on this. Um, it's, it's sort of an arbitrary change, but I think it will improve things. And if we do go with this, um, this next sprint would end on Tuesday the 15th, and that would add two days to the, to the sprint. Um, if you have thoughts on this, um, pipe up, or, um, or we can talk about that on, on the core dev mailing list. A anyone have thoughts on that? I think, I think it's good. Sense. I'm glad. Go ahead, Kailash. Uh, I was just saying, I think that's a good idea. Okay. Um, Mateo? Yeah, same here. And I think uh, if we need to to have the um, platform call anyway, we can move that for, uh, for a week. Right, right. Okay. I'm a little bit more concerned about the TST, but maybe we can decide to move it to Thursday or uh, any other uh, arbitrary day. I don't think it's a big issue. Yeah, I, I think we could, the other thing is we could have it in the afternoon. We could have the planning meeting or the, the review meeting in the afternoon. I, I realize that I've been trying to, um, historically we had it at two o'clock in the afternoon um, for planning, but that didn't really work with the people who were in Europe. So um, that's why I've been trying to move those to the morning. 
so it's it's the standard scheduling problems that any organization has. So um, <laughs> that said, um, let's let's switch over to Jira. Um, all righty, and I'm going to make this bigger and switch over to uh, you know, to start off. We have container-based orchestration. Andy. Yes, so I was investigating the feasibility of integrating OpenStack Helm um, into Cord or integrating it with XOS and, and BTN and Onos. And I had came to the conclusion that it does seem like it probably would be pretty easy to integrate and pretty clean integration. So I've been, um, this sprint I've been working on essentially getting a, a proof of concept that this is possible by manually uh, configuring all of the pieces to talk to each other and showing them uh, working together. I'm not 100% done with that. I guess the I, I've gotten it to the point where I deployed OpenStack Helm on the, the prepped cube cluster and used XOS to bring up a VM, um, but the, the BTN Onos integration is, is still the, the main missing piece of that. Um, so that's that's what I'm looking at now, but uh, I have no reason to believe that it's not going to be feasible to do it. So um, I, I consider that done. The feasibility is established. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, 2943 um, was mine, update to released version of CubeSpray. Previously, um, about a month ago, we had a problem where CubeSpray broke uh, with a bunch of how it integrated with the rest of our build system. Uh, I updated to the 2.5 release of CubeSpray, which uh, hopefully will uh, be a little bit more stable. That also updated Kubernetes from 1.9.3 to 1.9.5. Uh, and that, um, that worked out pretty well. Um, it didn't have much breakage uh, other than uh, how CubeSpray dealt with a few variables and other things. Uh, moving on, uh, deployments and build up um, uh, and build automation. I think these, um, these are all uh, Luca and me. The first one is I uh, use automation containers from pre-built Docker Hub images. This uh, didn't was low priority and didn't hit my um, uh, didn't I didn't end up working on this much this sprint, um, but that's going to probably increase in priority as as goes forward um, because this is reintegrating the mass containers. Uh, the next three items I think are Luca's. Um, I think he might have finished 2653, which is the OLT software. I think he packaged that, but he hasn't updated it in Jira yet. Uh, and the last two, um, Kailash, did you work at all on 2652, the building the drivers and dev files? Uh, I created the job, Jenkins job template for that job, but I think Luca and Shad had um, completed the um the script the pipeline script for that so i think they got it running on the old jenkins and we migrated over to a new one but i don't know when and how they plan on running these jobs um for now i think uh luca had said it's going to be a manual trigger but i think they got it done okay i'll follow up with luca about that yeah okay moving on um no documentation no ecord uh, expanding QA coverage. I think this is. Um, I can go over these. Yeah, that'd be great, Kailash. Okay. Um, yeah. So in terms of the new Jenkins, we got the um, API test verifications all complete. So they're listening on all this, um, all the XOS service repos, in addition to platform install and um, the code repo. Uh, so. We're using um, the, the job templates that Zach created. Um, so they'll be triggering um, on all the builds and then also the past three releases. So if anyone sees failures in that, um, we did run into a couple issues with some of the older branches um, and we're fixing them as they go. So if you guys see any of the failures in any of the API tests or any verification jobs for that matter, you know, just let me or 
Zach or Suchitar know, and we'll get right on it. Um, and then we also migrated the nightly build jobs. So QCT pod one and three have been migrated to the new Jenkins server. Um, we need to make some modifications in the old Jenkins files in Cord 4.0, 4.1, and 5.0 to um, reflect some stuff on the new Jenkins server in terms of the um, execution node. So I'm getting that done. I'll, I'll have that done today. Um, I'm doing a trial run right now on Cord 4.0. So hopefully by tonight, we have the nightly build cycles running. Um, on QCT pod one from 4.0 all the way till master. Um, and then once that's passing on QCT one and four, I'll delete those from the old Jenkins server. Um, let me see here. Um, and then Suchitra had worked on a couple of scripts that will allow us to do some scale testing on um, the CPEs. So I don't think she's run any of the tests on the physical pods yet, but she has worked on a script on it. So I think she's planning on running and trying to get some numbers for us prior to 6.0. So I think she's going to prioritize that next sprint. Um, and then, yeah, that sums it up. Um, minus the JJB for Sonar Cube, if you want to go over that, Zach. Yeah, that's, um, I made JJB jobs, Jenkins job builder jobs on the new uh, Jenkins server that runs Sonar Cube. That which is the, okay. the thing I showed. Um, moving on, uh, fabric features and improvements. Do we have uh, okay. which here? Yeah, I can speak for both. So uh, we have, I think, a couple of items uh, uh, that comes from uh, the previous sprint. I think uh, they were 28.37 for uh, Andrea, and for me, 2838, 2833, 2834. Basically, they were reviewed at code that uh, need to be reviewed and then I just push the button. Uh, new items uh, in this print uh, for Andrea was uh, 2904. Basically, we had uh, a bug in the FPM of the router. When an instance goes down, basically, uh, the we have some um, uh, state that was not clean. Then we worked together on the wiki, and basically we documented all the new uh, functionality that uh, we developed in the previous print. Uh, and these are the item 2911, uh, and for me, uh, 2901. Uh, as regards my task, uh, uh, I update the multicast test plan uh, for this new functionality. Uh, I improved the Honest Diagnostic, that is a new tool that we have uh, to troubleshoot problem in Honest with the new multicast command. Then uh, 2903 and 2937, uh, they are some uh, new feature that we need to develop in order to have uh, 2839 properly working. So basically, we are going to support uh, multiple streams for multicast, and we need to improve our, our uh, REST API are commands in order to take into account these different tree. And uh, 2937, basically, we changed the word partition in the multicast handling. Uh, uh, before, we were using the mastership of the device. Uh, and basically, we check if the instance was the, masters, uh, was the master of the source. Uh, so that instance uh, programmed the, the tree. But now, since we are going to have uh, multiple sources, this does not old anymore and uh, basically now we are using the word partition service and that's it thanks pierre uh, let's let's move on um m cord um for this sprint uh, uh the at first uh, we, the intel want to set up their port so uh, because uh, during the day before the conference the mwos only oef have one port all the other collaborators only contributed to some of the components they didn't have a port uh, those days they started to build a port so we helped them to build a port and uh, we helped them to create the sim card and um, 
uh, for me, uh, my mainly working on, on the documentation of 5.0. And uh, uh, there are also some other tasks I didn't uh, uh, put right down in Jira. Uh, it's mainly work with the collaborators. And uh, because they, they doing the two conferences, some of the collaborators used our um, code setup. So they have some issues. We uh, collect their issues and discuss with them. And uh, uh, as I said, those days they started to build their own pod. So we help them to build their own pod for uh, the main, main contributors. And uh, also we uh, designed, uh, during this sprint, we designed the plan for the next uh, step. Uh, like uh, for example, the Samsung want to integrate their SSD to our uh, uh, M code pod, uh, something like this. Uh, that's all. Thanks, Big Bang. Um, maintenance. Uh, so I'll I'll go over my first ones. Um, we uh, did a bunch of updates. Uh, this sort of to follow up the updates that happened uh, last sprint. Um, we updated a bunch of Python packages. Uh, we changed uh, from using the um, uh, there was a there was a previous use of uh, our own. Uh, container for Postgres database. We changed to using a public one, and then we removed the old one. Uh, a bunch of deprecation warnings. Um, you also notice um, 2881. Um, Sutitra requested that um, we change the highest priority in Jira to be blocker and change the icon so that it, now you can mark things as blocker in Jira. So use that, or notice that anything that was marked highest before is now blocker. I, I like the way the new icon stands out. It really grabs yeah. your attention. It's not just like a different shade of, of, of orange or red, red or whatever. Yeah. Um, that was actually much easier. That took me like two minutes to do in Jira, <laughs> which is surprising. Uh, updated um, some Docker-related things for Image Builder. And then um, the last thing I had was um, Ansible 251 came out, and it broke generating the image whitelist when you're running, making a uh, pod config. Um, so I fixed that last night. Um, Mateo, did you want to go? Uh, yeah, I can go. So Corda 2827, uh, the bug in XOS is still there. I didn't get a chance to, uh, to work on it. Uh, I hope to get it done next sprint. Uh, but that that is a problem that we can see only during development when you uh, rebuild uh, multiple time the core container without cleaning the cookies in the GUI. So I don't think the priority is too high for now. Uh, Twenty-eight eighty-eight. <clears throat> we now have a formal mechanism in the synchronizer to pull information from the VNF and keep the data model uh, up to date. I think Scott has used it for his um, explorative work uh, in, uh, in Kubernetes, and we're using it in the Volta synchronizer to read the uh, OLT devices and the news that are uh, pre provisioned in Volta. Uh, core 2912, it's a new uh, method in the service instance class that lets you find uh, a property. Uh, up in the chain, so you don't need to be aware in which position your service uh, sits, because uh, it, it will uh, recursively look up in the chain to find the data that your service needs. And I think there is something else below. Yeah, this is Corda 2938, moving the API convenience method in the synchronizer uh, repo. It's something I'm still working on. Uh, basically, a developer can define some, uh, some helper method for the APIs to combine data or do some other kind of, um, of facilitation. But the only issue was that they were defined as part of uh, XOS core. Uh, and that is not a clean solution because uh, uh, any time you change uh, a service, you may need to change code in the core. So we're moving those in the, in the synchronizer container. And that's it. I hope to get it done early next week. OK, thanks, Matteo. Uh, Scott? 
Okay, so the first one was VSG hardware service instances not deleted. Uh, that was a model policy that needed to be added to the VSG hardware uh, synchronizer. And the way that model policy works is it watches to see when the final service instance link to a uh, service instance goes away, uh, and then it deletes the service instance. So that's been added. Um, set dark. Dirty models should return a list of models that were dirtied. So QA uh, needed to use set dirty models uh, for something, but I realized it was it was kind of difficult because it didn't tell you what it actually dirtied, so you didn't really know that it actually worked. So I fixed that so it does return a list of what it dirties. Um, inconsistent state when BSG instances are, are deleted. Um, I haven't started on that one. I did try to reproduce it and failed. So either I'm not doing the right thing or somehow it got fixed, I suspect I'm just not doing the right thing. Uh, the problem there is that sometimes someone would delete a, an instance and dangling state would remain and VSG would not create recreate the instance properly. Um, fabric service fails to make progress if instances were deleted. This was just um, adding some more checking to the uh, fabric services synchronizer so that um, if it came across an instance that was bad, it would not um, throw an exception and stop its loop. Um, validation error is not defined. Uh, that was in Xproto. Um, there was uh, something that threw a validation error and that was just the wrong name of the exception. At the same time, I got rid of the security policy that um, actually a validation policy that required slice names to be prefixed by their site name. Um, that's something we've been wanting to get rid of for a while and it was actually what was causing this validation error as well. So that's gone now. Um, OpenStack synchronizer silently skips steps if Nova enabled is false. So if, um, I think this is something Andy ran into if in your synchronizer config file, uh, you had Nova enabled equals false, the synchronizer just wouldn't run any of its steps and you'd be you'd be wondering why it wasn't doing anything. So it now does at least emit a warning in that case. Uh, Tosca key error when saving OLT device in uh, the legacy end to end. Uh, that was just something that was missing from a Tosca recipe. So I added that. OpenStack synchronizer deletes steps that fail are not retried. So this appears to have been a longstanding bug in the OpenStack synchronizer. If you run a delete step, for example, deleting an instance and it failed, um, then it would mark that as successful and uh, purge the object from the database even though it was never deleted. So that's been fixed and they will uh, now retry. Okay, thanks Scott. Um, Andy? So I added the ability to specify a, a domain, uh, OpenStack domain when authenticating to OpenStack in the, the OpenStack synchronizer. And this was something that, that OpenStack Helm required. So that's why I added it. OK, thanks, Andy. Uh, moving on, uh, R chord. Scott? Uh, uh, yeah, so the first thing here is R chord subscriber devices are incorrectly modeled. Uh, that's a uh, low priority item that has to do with the, you know, mom's PC, dad's PC, the stuff that we use to test. Uh, parental controls, um, use proxy models uh, that we don't support anymore and we don't have Tosca support for. I, I suppose moving forward with the new R chord, we'll have to reevaluate whether this is even something that deserves to be fixed. Okay, thanks. Um, Jono? Um, yeah. So the um, this design echo workflows has turned out to be kind of kind of a long-standing task, um, and uh, we did a little bit more work on that. Sort of, you know, every time we talk to providers, we learn more information about what the workflows are going to be. Um, so there's some work being done on that. And then the the final task was one that actually Mateo did. I'm not sure. I think I had a duplicate that was assigned to me, um, but that's that's Mateo's work that was done. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, not in refactor, build, deploy, clean up. Let's move on. Um, deploy XOS and ONOS using Helm charts. 
Uh, uh, so the first item is XOS container should be resilient to database connectivity issues. Um, I dropped the priority of this down since we fixed the primary issue, which was um, not having the database available uh, when the container started. We're able to cover that. What we don't necessarily cover very well is if the database is uh, disconnected and reconnected later during some critical phase of the core. Um, that involves getting a third-party module in place. That third-party module required some more work, so we're going to have to go back and revisit that. Um, automating execution of Tosca recipes in the Kubernetes deployments. Um, that is the re-implementation of the Tosca loader container, uh, which is not high priority because the simple Tosca loader we have now currently works. Um, XOS SH launchable using uh, Kubernetes. So there's now a Helm chart for XOS SH. It's in the XOS tools directory of the Helm charts repo. There's a readme uh, that will tell you how to use it. So anyone who misses XOS SH now that you're using Helm, um, it's back again. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, the next few are mine. Um, well, there's now a validation jar job um, in Jenkins for the Helm charts repo. It runs the Helm lint command. Um, and so that, that works. Um, we found actually a bug in, in the auto-generated Helm templates, which uh, we got patched and put into Helm uh, master, which is nice. Um, Core 2847 researching HA for the Postgres database. I haven't worked on this because it's fairly low priority and um, uh, it probably, but it would be nice to have before release. And um, 2909 is what I'm currently working on, adding build targets for Helm charts on top of the uh, Kubernetes scenarios. So this is uh, running the control cube or prepped cubed um, scenario and then having it load the Helm charts from the Helm charts repo and configure them um, with a values file. Uh, I have this uh, mostly working. I have to basically dot I's and cross T's and figure out how we are actually passing variables in that values file. Um, I don't want to try re-encode the entirety of the values files that exist, which are pretty verbose. So, um, so maybe we need to go through and talk about how we're generating those uh, files. This also um, kind of brings up the topic of, um, in the profile, we previously had a list of services, and that list of services was then used to do things like uh, create um, the Docker Compose file and also used to drive tools like Image Builder to and other tools that pulled down images and versioned images and that sort of thing. Uh, if that's going away, we need to figure out a new way of doing that. Um, so this is sort of uh, seemed like a simple task and is exploding into a larger task um, as, as things do. Uh, that's, that's it for me. Um, Andy? So 2843 is just... Um, the integration of XOS as set up by Helm chart and Bolta is set up by Helm chart and Onos is set up by Helm chart. Um, I think we're ready to do that now. Um, and in fact, maybe somebody else has already made progress there. I'm not sure, but I haven't um, looked at that because previously we were blocked on, on the Bolta Helm chart, but now that that's done, I think we can we can do this, and I'll I'll take a look at the at it in the next sprint. Yeah, and if you want to assign that to me, uh, I think it should be just to change a line in the Tosca when we are creating the YLT service, and I'll have to work on that anyway, so I can pick that up. Okay, perfect. I will assign it to you. Um. 2905 was um, containerizing the XOS API sanity tests. So I rolled up a, a, a Docker container for that contained the the current um, API sanity tests, at least as as performed on the the old Jenkins, um, and integrated it with Helm so that you can type Helm test XOS core after you install the XOS core and it will run the sanity tests. Um, so I think there's a lot of possibility to 
to use that same container to run uh, other tests on the 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 R chord profile when we bring that up. Um, but that's some, maybe something that, that we should talk about um, in the next sprint or, or sometime in the near future. Uh, and this was just creating a Helm chart for XOS's OpenStack service because I needed that to get um, XOS's installed by Helm to talk to OpenStack Helm. And that's done. OK, thanks, Andy. Uh, moving on. Uh, OVS CNI with the cord Kubernetes. Um, this 2890 is my item. I'm adding support for the Multis CNI. Um, there's a patch set from one of the Linker Networks guys. Uh, uh, I've, I'm spacing his name right now, but it's in uh, uh, it, it's in uh, Garrett right now. Uh, the problem is that I updated his patch, and when we updated Cube Spray, um, some of the the way that the patch is integrated broke um, because it's trying to patch files that Cube Spray downloaded. Um, and so I'm, I'm still in the process of making that work. This is not, um, I should probably downgrade the priority of this. This is um, something that we need, but is mainly for uh, container-based VNFs, uh, which is sort of the bonus item for this um, release, not a prior, not the highest priority. Um, moving on, um, XOS Kubernetes synchronizers to instantiate VNFs. Uh, Scott? Sure. So there's two items here. I'll start with the second one first, which was to check in the empty scaffolding for the Kubernetes synchronizer and service. Uh, that's done. Um, then the other item was to create an exploratory uh, proof of concept Kubernetes synchronizer uh, for horizontally scalable services. That's also done. Um, I'll be doing a demo of that at the end of the uh, review today, and we can talk more about what it does um, during the demo. Okay, um, great. Uh, moving on. Um, OpenStack deploying OpenStack using Cola. Uh, Scott? Sure. So the first item was to see if the Neutron ML2 plugin can be removed. Um, this involved uh, modifying uh, the BTN synchronizer so it would make all of the BTN API calls rather than the ML2 plugin uh, making those calls. That was successful. Um, though we ended up in a situation where we still can't get rid of the plugin because it needs to call the uh, bind port method. Um, so I think what we'll do when Andy is to that point in his uh, OpenStack Helm integration is we'll replace the ML2 driver we're using now with one that is um, stripped down to just make those bind port calls. But unfortunately, we do still need a driver. Okay, thanks, Scott. Andy? 2945 is in progress. This is just creating a Helm chart for BTN service. So the Helm chart is done, but uh, I'm still grappling with uh, the related Tosca that can be used to, to um, bring up uh, the, the nodes in XOS so that BTN actually works. OK, thanks, Andy. Moving on. Um, R-Cord Zero Touch subscriber positioning and then for the NoVSG scenario. Um, Mateo? Yeah, so to make this quick, these are uh, all the operation we need to activate a subscriber. Um, they are currently working in the development uh, environment and I think Luca managed to deploy uh, the full setup end of this week. Uh, so hopefully uh, next week we can validate them on the real pod. But we tried, uh, Luca tried the manual configuration on the hardware pod and that is working. The configuration looks correct in the development pod and uh, the de development uh, environment. So I don't see any reason for them not to work. Okay, thanks, Matteo. Um, this there aren't any other items in this um, epic. Can I close this out, or are more going to show up next sprint? Uh, more are going to show up. 
next week, but uh, maybe we can uh, close this one and we'll open a new one uh, next sprint. Because the fourth thing I'll need to do next sprint will be to um, work on the V router synchronizer. And I sent out on the mailing list a proposal to refactor how the fabric service is modeled. Uh, so I guess most of my sprint will go with that. OK, I'm going to go ahead and close this one out. Um, work is done. Yeah, that, that's fine for me. OK, great. Um, issues without epics. Uh, the first item was the use the off-the-shelf Postgres database container. That was um, that that was successful. We're now using the Alpine-based one, and it's I think it's like 15 megabytes. It's tiny, mm -hmm. so that's a big improvement over the 100 plus megabyte previous one we were using. Um, and uh, Core 2913, um, I did a bunch of work to bring over jobs to the Jenkins Job Builder. Um, uh, for the CI management repo, there's a readme that explains sort of everything to do to make a new job and sort of the infrastructure to help you understand Jenkins Job Builder, which um, is really takes the toolkit approach. Here are all a bunch of tools, but it doesn't really show you how to use them. So um, it's a little bit opinionated in telling people how to structure jobs. Um, and also, um, there's local testing. You can do a make test, and it will make build all of the Jenkins Job Builder files and verify that they uh, that you're not going to get rejected when you um, submit that to Jenkins for uh, validation. Uh, that's it for me, uh, Mateo. Yes. Uh, so to create our core service, uh, I never update the priorities, actually a low priority just to be consistent with the way all the other services are our model. Uh, we are now using the generic service class for the R core service, while we should create uh, a proper R core service. Okay, thanks, Matteo. Um, Twenty eight ninety seven is Luca's item. Um, this was he needed a DHCP container for uh, one of the deployments, um, so we made a Helm chart for that. Um, and then uh, Kailash. Um, yeah, so this last one, um, it's I have to go back to code 4.0, 4.1, and 5.0 to update the Jenkins file to reflect um, the new dev node name on the new um, Jenkins server. Uh, so doing that right now will probably be done today. So um, yeah, I just realized that after the builds were failing after the last couple of days. So uh, yeah. OK, thanks, Kailash. Uh, that's all for JIRA. Um, just to give you guys a look at the report, uh, we did pretty good this, uh, this sprint. Um, we knocked out, I, I think, a larger than average number of, of tickets. Um, but then again, if you look at the last two sprints, uh, we knocked out about 90 tickets, and we knocked out 135 this time. Um, which is pretty good. I think the previous two sprints were, uh, we had ONS and some other things going on. So that was probably the mitigating factor there. Um, so next sprints. Uh, the next sprint uh, was scheduled 423 to 511. That might become 515. Um, how we deal with uh, the Tuesday, Wednesday thing for sprints five and six, uh, we'll have to rework schedule wise. I'm, I'm going to run that by Yen and see uh, what she'd like to do. Um, but what I think we're going to do is um, sprint five will be shorter, and so will sprint six. Um, historically, I think we've been better about a feature freeze and hardening being um, uh, taking less time uh, for the 5.0 release. Um, it felt a little bit like we were, uh, were twiddling our thumbs at the end there. So um, uh, sprint planning is next Monday on the 23rd. From 10.30 to 11.30, this is after the A court and M court meetings, uh, which usually happen 9.30 to 10.30 PT. Um, it's in the morning, so um, it's easier for people in Europe to join. Um, and that's it. Um, but I think we have a demo from Scott. Sure. OK, let me hand over the uh, make you the presenter. OK. 
Okay, working on trying to share my screen. Which it is not letting me do yet. Are you using the application or the web interface? Um, I'm using the app, but I just noticed it did put up a window that says um, you've been made the presenter. So I just was ignoring the fact that it popped something up. So let me try share. Uh, do you have a window with like three terminals in it? Yep. Yep. Okay. So these three, I've got an XOSSH running. Um, I've got just a, a Linux prompt over here, and then I've got the synchronizer down in the corner. Um, like all synchronizers, it's just going to continuously loop and output all kinds of stuff that it's doing. Um, no need to really pay attention to what's going on down there. Uh, but we'll interact with it over XOSSH and uh, see some of the things it can do. Um, I should mention that this is what we decided to call an exploratory prototype. This is not necessarily final code. It's probably not going to get, um, you know, merged into the repo. It is checked in as patch set for anyone who wants to look. Uh, but we are planning on meeting on Tuesday to go over more uh, modeling um, that will probably influence Kubernetes synchronizer design and lead us to the final. So treat this as just a lightweight proof of concept. So there are Kubernetes service instances. It does use one of the new pull steps uh, to populate those by looking at uh, what's already in Kubernetes. So if we do um, look at the Kubernetes service instance objects, we'll see there's a bunch of them. Uh, for example, you know, there's some of our synchronizers and stuff. Uh, so let's look at the first one. Uh, the first one is this R cord light. Um, and if we look inside of it, uh, we can see that it's picked up a pod IP address. Um, it'll also automatically generate a slice for it. So there's a slice that goes along with it. Looking inside of the slice, I'm not sure there's much exciting in here, but there is um, a trust domain, which is default. And there probably is a principal which is also default. So trust domain in principle, those correspond to Kubernetes uh, namespaces and service accounts. Um, so if we wanna actually create some stuff, we can do that as well. So here's a new trust domain called demo trust. And it probably ran a sync step in there though it, it flew by pretty quick. But if we look at kubectl get namespaces, uh, we'll see there's now a demo trust. We can create a principle. And we can see the uh, service count has shown up. Uh, we can make an image. So images don't actually get realized in Kubernetes. They're just an XOS uh, item at this time. And then we can make a new slice. So this is a slice called my site demo one. Uh, it's hooks up to the first site using the trust domain, the principle we created. And then finally, we will create a new service instance in it. So this should lead to creating a pod. So if we go over here and we do a get pods. Uh, there's now a pod called demo pod that's running. Uh, now we can also create um, services. So let me create another new trust domain. And I will create a new service. And I'll put a slice inside of that service. And then finally, I'm going to add a port to the service. Uh, ports allow us to map... Um, port numbers outside of Kubernetes, you know, port numbers exposed to the outside world, uh, to port numbers um, inside of uh, containers. Um, sort of like what we used to do with uh, Docker Compose with exposing port numbers. But if we look in here inside of the namespace, um, what did I call it? Service one trust, get services. We'll see there's a new service called service one. Service, service 
one. And we can see that this uh, service one is exposing a port called the web, it's port number 80 inside the containers, port number uh, 30080 um, inside the containers, and it's got an IP address. Uh, so that I think that's all I wanted to show. Um, that's the exploratory prototype. Like I said, if anyone wants to see it, it's in the draft patch. I can I can add you and you can have a look. That's it. That looks really cool, Scott. Um, I have two questions, one dependent on the other. Um, are you using? Are you pulling information from uh, Kubernetes to populate uh, the um, Kubernetes service uh, instances? Yeah. So that big long list that you saw initially. Um, let me go back to it. It's, that one. So that was all using a pull step. So there's a pull step. Um, we didn't get to see that run because you know it ran when I first fired up the synchronizer, but it learned all of the existing pods uh, that were inside of Kubernetes. Okay, cool. Uh, so for that, I'm thinking that we uh, it's it's not a priority, of course, but that can be very cool to implement like a um, health check for a uh, XOS core. Because um, the core knows uh, which synchronizer uh, have been started because of uh, the load model's call. And we can combine those data with this data and check if the containers are properly running and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I think so. Once we have you know a Kubernetes service that's pulling in all of the information about Kubernetes, we can we can start to leverage that in lots of ways. And as you say, we can we can compare, you know, what we learn from, from what we think the state should be in, and we could notice when when a service has gone down. So and you know, I think this will also enable us you know, if we had a BSG and it went down, um, or, or a VNF or something else, we could notice and repair it as yeah. opposed to the situation we've been in with OpenStack where we just never find out that something went bad. Yeah, that looks really cool, and plus it enables us uh, to, to deploy containerized VNF. That is a great target for the future. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you like it. And and as I said, for anyone who wants to join, we've got a meeting on Tuesday uh, where we're going to deep dive into the uh, the modeling between XOS and Kubernetes and uh, how these concepts um, will match together. So, so Scott, I have a question. Is the thought here that we, you can you can create in both directions? You can create in Kubernetes, and you can create in XOS. Um, is the thought to um, have XOS bring up its own uh, services and synchronizers? So, could you possibly pass a a Tosca file to XOS and have it onboard like the Arcord set of services, or is that still going to happen through Kubernetes? Uh, through Helmer. So I had not thought I had not thought of doing that, but that does seem possible. It, it seems like the point we started out, you know, when we started tackling Kubernetes in the control plane was that all all horizontally scalable services were going to be brought up externally. But once we have a Kubernetes synchronizer, I think we can certainly explore having XOS bring up the horizontally scalable services, including you know, XOS's own components. So, yeah, we could get to that point where you could hand XOS an R-Cord Lite profile and it could cause all of those synchronizers to be brought up. If that's the point we want to end up at, I, I think we do need some discussion on that. From the perspective of, um, of eating our own dog food, um, having the build steps happen inside XOS seems better than having an external build system if we want to get rid of that sort of the code. Which well, that that's not really a build step because you you'll need to have pre-built images published somewhere in order for Kubernetes to deploy them. Yeah, you're right, Matteo. I, I think I'm. I think I meant to say deploy step. Yeah, that that will. Uh, I think it it can replace the Elm charts if if we want to. But as as Scott said, we may need some further discussion on this. Yeah, yeah, and particularly, you know, Gopi's not here, and I don't, 
I don't want us to go too far into the decision making process without without his input. So um, he's going to be one of the primary contributors on the uh, Tuesday meeting. So hopefully we can we can get some of these details hashed out then. Yeah, also th this is something we can sort out in the future. I think the first thing we we'll need to do with uh, Kubernetes will be enable VNFs. And yeah, once, once we have that, we can improve. It'd be nice if someone would come up with a good sample BNF that we want to deploy. Um, that'd be cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, then. Um, is if, if that's it, um, I think that ends the meeting. Uh, do, are there any other comments, um, questions? Alrighty, um, I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, thank you all for attending this, um, and talk to you later. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, guys.